Good morning, everyone. So, as I said, my name's Dan. I'm here to talk to you about building a data-driven AppSec program with Kiln. This is an open source project I've been working on in work and spare time. Um, security conference, so what kind of presentation would this be without a Who Am I slide? So I'm at Dan Hates Numbers on the Twitters, if that's your thing. I'm an AppSec engineer at Simply Business. We're a small business insurance brokers. Prior to that, I was a quality engineer and a software engineer. And I'm also the father to a very sleepy boy. <laughs> I figure I'd go for an easy win early on because dogs, they're good. <laughs> so let me set the scene. So in most development environments, you'll probably have some sort of CI setup. And typically those pipelines will do linting, they'll do unit testing, there may be some UI testing. You can tell I used to be a quality engineer. Um, you might run security tools as part of like a manual code review. That might be static code analysis. That might be dependency analysis. If you've got a particularly mature CI setup, you might have security tools running as part of your pipeline itself. So for our Ruby applications, we have like Bundler Audit, RuboCop, and Breakman as part of our pipelines. But if a tool finds something and breaks the build, which in most cases it probably should, someone's going to need to log into Jenkins, go find the build that's failed, go find the step that's failed, dig through console logs, figure out why it's failed. And as a developer, that means I need to leave the environment I'm normally working in, whether that's my editor, Slack, GitHub issues. And as a security engineer, I'm not going to see any of this. And I think we can do better. And I think, particularly in small teams and small companies, we have to do better. A friend of mine once told me that prioritization in big companies is the difference between do we do this in Q1 or do we do this in Q3 or 4? In smaller teams, it's a difference between do we do this now or do we not do this? So we've already got limited time, limited people, and I think we need to be better at prioritizing where we focus that time and energy. Now, businesses have been using data to drive decision-making for years. If you look at the di disciplines of business intelligence, marketing, UX, product development, data really is king. And that would be things like A-B testing conversion rates. You send some of your customers down one journey with one set of wording, and then you could send the other side down a different journey with ever so slightly different wording. And they'll measure the conversion rates and use that to go, that's the copy we're going to use. And it's clearly working for them. And I think that as security folks, we should be doing that too. As an engineer, I want to be able to ask questions like this. I want to be able to ask which projects have got which security tools in their CI pipelines. I want to be able to ask, we've held some security training. Say we got Scott Hellman to do Hack Yourself first. Have we seen any changes in our security posture in the three months since we did that? What projects are our biggest source of risk? Now, we don't have the data to be able to answer these questions currently. So we've just gone through Q1 prioritization at work and... The data to answer these kind of questions could have resulted in some very different decisions being made in that prioritization. So hopefully, you, like Willem Dafoe, are screaming out internally to tell me how. So I'll tell you how. Hopefully, Keln. So the idea behind Keln is it should make it nice and easy for you to run security tools. If you're a, say you're a Node.js shop, and you want to run NCC Scout Suite to audit your AWS environment, you should not need to worry about Python 2 deprecation, oh. Python 3, which version does Scout Suite suites run on. You should just be able to run the tool, get your findings, and carry on with your day. Kiln also performs data collection on the output of these tools, and then does some parsing, some normalization, and some data enrichment, which makes it a bit easier to analyze. And then you can use the data that that has uh, generated to drive better decision making about where to focus your time and energy. So hopefully the demo gods are going to be kind to me because we've got not one but two live demos for this. So first off, I'm going to show you how users would typically interact with Kelm through a command line tool. And I'm going to be using the OWASP Rails Go uh, vulnerable application for this um, and the Bundler Audit Dependency Analyzer. So this is going to be in an interactive setting, but where this will really shine is if you put this in your CI pipelines and it's running on every single commit. So 
which way were my got my demo terminal on the wrong screen So, so I've got a clone of Rails Goat here, and I've dropped a quick configuration file in there that just uh, says what the app name is and where to fire all this data off to. So if I run kiln CLI Ruby dependencies, so this is going to fire up bundle roll it in a Docker container. It's going to mount my code in that container, run bundle roll over it, and we can see that we've got vulnerabilities in Puma and Rack. And then on the right, you can see that that's popped out in a Slack channel I've got set up. So we can see what package is affected, what version of that package is affected. What app is it in? Brief description of the problem. What commit did we see this on? A CVSS score, so you can get a rough idea of how severe it is. And then a link to the advisory so you can go find out what versions do I need to upgrade to to patch this vulnerability. So there's more than just the CLI tool and how we got to Slack. There's a few bits in between that makes the magic happen. So we've got the command line tool, which I've shown you. We've got a data collection endpoint, and that's going to perform some validation and um, yeah, validation and normalization to get it into a Kafka cluster, which is where we store all of our data. We've then got something that's parsing those reports, extracting the individual findings, and turning them into normalized versions. So you shouldn't need to know whether this has come from a Python dependency analyzer or a Ruby one. You should just know you've got a vulnerability in one of your dependencies. And then we've got one or more service connectors, which gets Kiln talking to the outside world. So what does that look like? So all of the moving parts in this are Docker containers. Um, I realize not everywhere uses Docker, but it makes things fairly portable. So on the left, we've got the Kiln security scanner. So that would be the tool that you're trying to run. That will then bundle up all that um, tool output, some metadata about the Git repo, what environment you're running it in and fire it off to the data collection endpoint. That's going to do that first pass of validation, and that will make sure that anything that's downstream uh, is working with good quality data. That goes into a Kafka topic, and then we've got the service at the bottom, the report parser, which is going to be looking for those raw events coming in, and that's going to be doing the heavy lifting, heavy lifting of extracting findings and looking up severity scores in the NIST NVD. That's going to republish it to a different Kafka topic, and then we've got the Slack connector that's listening for those dependency events coming in, and that's going to formulate a Slack message and fire it off to Slack's API endpoint. Now, the Slack connector is, like, Kiln's fairly young. We cut our first release a couple weeks ago. Um, so the Slack connector and Bundler Audit are kind of our MVP, um, but we are going to be expanding those in upcoming releases, so there's more tools and more service connectors available. So it's a modular system built using an event sourcing architecture. If you're not familiar with the term event sourcing, I'll get onto that in just a sec. And it's built around an Apache Kafka cluster for data storage. Everything's packaged up in Docker containers, like I said. Everything's written in Rust, which I personally love. Uh, and it's all open source and MIT licensed. So you can use it for pretty much whatever you want. So I mentioned event sourcing. So Way, a good way to think about this is if you imagine a bank account, instead of directly updating the account's balance every time you have a debit or credit transaction, instead, you would create an event which would represent this is a new bank account with a zero balance, and then every transaction would just be a new event in that stream that says this account has had this money debited, this account has had this money credited. And then if you wanted to know the balance at any point in time, you just replay those events from the beginning of time up to right now, and that will let you build your balance. Now, Kafka, which is what is we're using for all of our data storage, is a, and this is a bit of a mouthful, a distributed, <laughs> fault-tolerant, append-only commit log. No, it's not a blockchain. 
<laughs> I'm not here to talk to you about blockchains. <laughs> so basically, you can spin up a cluster of servers that will automatically shard data across those servers. And then if you've got a outage in a data center, say you're running in US East 1 and all of their EC2 nodes suddenly lose network connectivity, just picking a, a hypothetical situation that's never happened, <laughs> um, then Kafka, up to a certain point, will carry on serving transactions. So it'll keep accepting data and keep allowing consumers to read data out. And then once those nodes come back online, data will be rebalanced. Everything goes back to normal. It lets you build a record of changes over time, which works quite nicely with that event sourcing architecture that I talked about. And it means that each component can build a view of the data that they need. So you don't need to model your data in such a way that you have to compromise between all of the things that need to use that data. You model it in like real world events, and then each system can handle those events and build a, sh a view and a shape of that data that suits what they're trying to do. Um, so hopefully this diagram is visible to most of you. Can, can you see that at the back? Yeah. So this is a way of visualizing what a Kafka cluster looks like. So you have a number of topics and there are partitions within those topics. So a producer will send messages to a topic and then our consumers on the right will be reading messages from a topic and Kafka has these things called consumer groups. So if you need to deploy multiple replicas of a component, you can stick them in a consumer group and then Kafka will manage breaking up that data about as evenly as it can across those consumers. And then if one of them dies, that partition in that topic will get assigned to a different live consumer and you don't need to worry about any of that. So Kafka also makes it really easy to react to events as they happen. So it's it lets you set up like a pub sub uh, messaging broker model. And it also allows you to design a system that can recover from data processing bugs. So say you're doing some calculations on events and you realize there's a bug in that calculation, you're getting the wrong results. <coughs> you can fix the bug, deploy your patch version of this component, and then rebuild the data that you've calculated from those events and everything's good again. And because you've got quite loose coupling between components, because nothing's talking to another component directly, it all goes via Kafka, you can plug in new components quite nicely. So I promised you data-driven decisions. So we're going to do a second live demo. And I really hope the demo gods are going to be kind to me this time. So we're going to be using uh, Jupyter Notebooks in Jupyter Hub. Uh, if you've not played with Jupyter Notebooks before, um, they are a wicked tool for doing like interactive data analysis and exploration. It lets you mix blocks of Markdown and blocks of... It started with Python. There are other uh, language kernels available. If you like things like Julia or R, um, I think you can plug in Java. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. But it lets you mix Markdown blocks and executable blocks of code. And you can then share that notebook with someone else and they can reproduce everything that you've done, and it's got documentation in line. We're using Spark Streaming to read data from our Kafka topics, and we're using the Python Pandas library to do a lot of the heavy lifting. If you've not used Pandas, it basically gives you like a spreadsheet in Python, uh, which means that the analysis afterwards is quite nice. And what we're going to try and get to is a view of all of the CVEs that have landed in the master branch of three open source Ruby projects. So we're going with OWASP Rails Go, the Mastodon code base, and the GitLab code base. And what we want to find out is what is their average time to remediate a vulnerability in one of their open source dependencies? So, demo time. And if I ooh, hop over to where's my Jupyter notebook? There it is. And I'm quickly going to switch back to mirroring so I can actually see what I'm doing. Ah, where's it gone? There it is. Okay, so we're going to skip over the documentation at the at the start of this. Um, after today, I'm hoping to publish some documentation on how to set up the demo stack I've got running here and how to um, run this notebook and generate all the data I've used for the testing so you can have a play with Kiln and get your feet wet. 
So a lot of these blocks aren't going to be producing output until we get into the really interesting stuff. Um, and if you see an asterisk, that means a block is running. So bringing in some dependencies up front, pygit2 for interacting with a git repo, pyspark for doing all the reading from Kafka, uh, fast avro, I'll explain what avro is in just a second, but that's going to be decoding the data that comes out of Kafka, uh, and then pandas for our data processing. So we're going to spin up a um, Spark session. So when I was building this, um, I was doing this on a T3 medium EC2 instance, which has got like four gig of RAM and one core. And I kept running into the Linux out of memory killer and it manifested as these cells would just sit and hang forever because um, I'd eaten up all my RAM and Linux was like, no RAM for you and killed processes, including half of my demo infrastructure. Uh, so now we're running on a T3A 2X large um, with like 32 gig of RAM and eight cores, which it's much happier with. So we're going to read in all of our dependency events from Kafka. It's all compressed, so we're going to decompress it on the way in, and we're going to spit it out into what's called a pandas data frame, which is that 2D spreadsheet I alluded to. Now, we're working with about a million events last time I looked. Um, so some of these steps take a, take a few seconds, um, and the decoding in particular is a very CPU-intensive task. So we're parallelizing this over seven cores, so we've got one left over for the system to keep doing its thing, dividing those million events up into about 30 partitions, and then decoding all that data. So I mentioned this is all encoded in Avro, so that's basically a binary serialization format that brings its schema with the data. So you can evolve your data schema over time and still be able to read data because it brings its own schema. So we're decoding all of those events and this takes a second. Um, if you were using, if there were fewer events, like if you were just analyzing like Rails Goat, for example, this runs in a couple of seconds. Uh, but yeah, we've got like a million here. Um, and yeah, this is um, what's known as an embarrassingly parallel problem. So there's no data dependencies on any other of these events. So you can parallelize it and throw as many cores as you've got. It. So we're going to, at the moment, we've currently got a roughly one million row, one column spreadsheet, which is not very helpful. So we're just going to break that out. So each object has its own <coughs> row, and then each field in that object has its own column. And we're going to group it by application name, and we're going to have a look at how many events we've got. So GitLab has got about 630,000, Mastodon about 190,000, and then Rails Goat has got about 20,000, because it's a much smaller project. And this is what a data frame looks like. So you've got a number of rows, and then we've got an event version and some IDs, what application this is in, the Git branch, which in this case is none, because I was running this sequentially over every commit in master. So we were in a detached head state in Git, no branch name available. Um, we've got a commit hash that we saw this in, the timestamp of when we saw this, the package that's affected, its version, the CVE ID, an advisory URL. Um, unfortunately, some of these are dead links because the RubySec database, which sits behind Bundler Audit, haven't migrated their advisories to stop using OSVDB, rip OSVDB. Um, but if they don't update that soon, then the report parser can take care of that for you and replace those dead links with live ones, which is an example of the sort of things we can get it to do to make this data easier to work with. Brief description of the problem and a CVSS score. Now, obviously, these are floats. Uh, remember, kids, don't compare floats to floats. They're not quite as exact as you think. Um, so now we're going to group that data by application name, and we're going to go through each of their Git repos, and we're going to find the commits that we saw these CVEs in, find the first one and the last one we saw it in, and then we're going to try and find the commit after the last one we saw it in, because at that point, the problem's fixed. And we're going to get the times that those commits happened, and we're going to chuck them in a dictionary keyed on the CVE ID. So we can see that Rails Goat's had 74 CVEs land in their master branch. It's a vulnerable application, so... Not that surprising. Mastodon's had 57, and GitLab's had 139, which, I mean, it's a big project. There's a lot of code there, and it's been going a while, so not that surprising. Let's cut them some slack. So 
Now we're going to go read in all the data from NIST's National Vulnerability Database. This is just sat as compressed JSON on disk. It's like 20 years worth of data. Um, and they provide uh, these nice data feeds with um, meta files, which lets you download like 400 bytes and then work out if you need to go download the several megabytes of JSON if it's been updated since you last looked at it. And we're going to go through, parse out all the CVE IDs and when they were published. And again, we're going to stick them in a dictionary because O1 lookups in this context are really nice. Um, and then we're going to go grab the CVE date for each of these and stick them in the dictionary for each of these applications. Now, I've had to be kind of defensive about how I've written this code. Um, some of the CVEs we see in the applications and that have come out of uh, Bundle or Audit, the CVEs, you go look them up in NIST database, and there's nothing there. So turns out what that is, is someone has reserved a CVE, they've got the number, they published that somewhere, but NIST doesn't know they've published it, so they don't have an entry in their database. So good example of how your data, if you're pulling it in externally, <laughs> not always going to be 100% perfect. So we've currently got CVEs across the top and then publication dates, etc., as uh, rows. So we're going to transpose those and we're going to drop every row where either the commit that fixed this vulnerability doesn't exist because it's still in master or the uh, publication date doesn't exist because of the issue I mentioned earlier. Uh, any of data buffs in the room might recognize this as a pivot table. Um, and then we're going to do some date maths and we're going to subtract our CV publication date from the date when it was fixed. And that should give us an idea of how long it took to fix that vulnerability. Now, some of these are going to be negative. So that means that the application upgraded from the vulnerable version of the library before the vulnerability was found. We're not interested in those, so we're going to drop them. And now we can see that Railsgoat has had 45 actual vulnerabilities in Master. Mastodon has had 24. And GitLab's had 67. So... Quick show of hands. Who remembers the price is right? Yeah? Nice to see you, to see you. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to play a little bit of the price is right. And we're going to look at the average remediation times for these projects. So we'll start with RailsGoat. So RailsGoat has got an average remediation time of 230 days. So who thinks that Mastodon's is going to be higher than that? No? Lower than that? Yeah? So, Mastodon has an average of 62 days, which I think might be being skewed by this one down here. Their longest one was 265 days, which is a bit of a whopper. Now, there might be a legit reason for that. They might have triaged the issue, realized they're not using the vulnerable part of the package that's affected, and gone, eh, we've got bigger fish to fry and moved on to something else, which is fair enough. Or it might be that they didn't know about it. It might be that upgrading dependencies has been um, flaky for them in the past. They've not got good test coverage. Upgrading a, upgrading a dependency breaks things. Or it might be that that part of the code base didn't have an owner anymore. So if this was an internal project and say it's a big monolith and no one, no one team is responsible for that part of it anymore, everyone will just go, ah, someone else will fix it and move on with the stuff that they've been told to do. So GitLab. Do we think GitLab's remediation time is going to be higher than Mastodon's? Got your hands? Higher, higher, higher. Who thinks it's going to be lower? Okay, so we're about an even split. So, it's higher. It's 79 days. And again, I think it's being skewed by this one, which is a whopping 18 months that that was sat in Master. 18 months. And again, could be a legit reason. Maybe not. So let's go and have a look at those. So if we have a look at Mastodon's, so we're going to sort by remediation time, grab the last one, and it's CVE 2015-9284. So we'll do a cheeky Google. So we can see that this was a vulnerability in the OmniAuth Ruby gem. It had a CSurf bug that allowed you to link accounts without intent, permission, interaction, or any feedback to the user. Basically, account takeover through CSERF 
when it's used in rails with a whopping 8.8 CVSS score. And that was there for about 260 days. So it might be that they weren't using it in Rails. They could have been using it in Sinatra, which is just a different Ruby web framework, um, in which case they might not have been affected, which is why it could have sat there for 200 days. So GitLab is CV 2018, 1,200,000. God, there were a lot of CVEs in 2018. <laughs> so this one is a bug in Doorkeeper version 4.20 and later, and it contains an access control issue where the token revocation APIs for OAuth tokens uh, would sometimes not revoke those tokens, which meant access was leaked until the token expired. Um, so not quite as severe as account takeover through CSERF, uh, but still a respectable 7.5. And again, it might have been that GitLab weren't using the vulnerable part, so they were like, eh, we got other stuff to do. We'll upgrade that when we need to. So hopefully, this gives you an idea of the sort of data you can get out of what's being generated by Kelm. And I'm going to swap back to my slides real quick. Uh, use a separate display. And there we go. So. There are some other ways of analyzing this data. So I've done this in like a batch query, but you could just as easily do this as a streaming application, reacting to those events as they come in. And you could have those stats being updated live and have them sat on a dashboard. Um, obviously, I've been doing this interactively. So this is how you could do like data exploration, but you could just as easily script that process and you don't have to execute each code block in turn. You just go boom and data. Uh, you can use this to identify common causes of bugs. So in an upcoming release, we're going to be adding support for like static code analysis tools. So you could start looking like, are we seeing lots of a particular class of vulnerability in particular parts of our application? And you could also use it to help prioritize your vulnerability remediation. So what does the future look like for Kiln? So we want to build a reporting dashboard. So for common queries like, I want to know what projects are running what tools and are they running them in master or feature branches? Are they running them in local or on CI servers? We want to add support for tools for other languages. So we want to add support for Python. Uh, we want to add support for JavaScript, that sort of thing. Uh, we want to do tools that are outside of source code scanning. So think uh, NCC Scout Suite, like I mentioned earlier, for auditing your cloud environment. <coughs> And Claire for Docker images. So being able to find out if you've got vulnerable libraries installed or if you're running an application as root, that should hopefully pick that up. We want to add support for more service connectors. So like I said, Slack is our MVP, but we want to add support for um, GitHub issues, Trello cards, Jira tickets, if Jira is what you use at work. Um, and we want to release documentation or better documentation. We've got some, but... Currently, there's no documentation on how to deploy this. That will change, hopefully, in like the next two days because I've got notes on how I set up that big demo stack. And some sample Jupyter notebooks on how you can analyze this data and start getting some inspiration for how the questions you might want to ask. Um, also, we, we deliberately cut some corners to get things ready for B-sides today. Uh, but in the next release, we want to go back and we want to polish all those out. And I want to make sure that if you're deploying Kiln in production, it is going to be rock solid so that you do not need to babysit it. Because it shouldn't make your life harder, it should make it easier. So, if you want to try Kiln for yourself, it's all on GitHub. And if you want to get involved, quite frankly, I would be thrilled. So, most of our development is coordinated in GitHub issues. Um, we've got a Gitter if you want to discuss something meteor, say if you want to make some like architectural changes, come and have a chat with me on Gitter. All of our contribution guidelines are in the README. It's a documentation of what tools you need to build uh, all the components. We also link to our code of conduct in there. If you take part in Kiln, you are expected to adhere by that code of conduct. I think that's only reasonable these days. And like I said, everything's written in Rust. Now, if you don't know Rust, there are still ways you can get involved. So by far the biggest way 
would be trying kiln out on your projects and submitting bug reports if you find anything. If you've got tools that you want to support or services you want kiln to connect up to, raise an issue on our backlog. I'd love to hear about it. If you find issues with our documentation, say something's unclear, there's missing documentation, there's typos, I consider those bugs in Kiln. Uh, we've got a template for it. Please tell me about it so I can fix it. And if data analysis is your thing, if that gets you going in the morning, um, I would love to hear some ideas for how we could analyze the data in different ways and be able to answer different questions. So I've just realized that I am 27 minutes short, but <laughs> first time speaker nerves, I've gone a little bit quick. But with that, I've been Dan Murphy. This has been building a data-driven AppSec program with Kiln. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, you mentioned uh, that you're mostly working on uh, Ruby stuff at the moment. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned uh, uh, Python as well. Um, yeah. Do you have plans to uh, start uh, to, to uh, support uh, both uh, like C Sharp and Java products as well? Um, yeah. So I don't currently have plans because I've not used C Sharp in about eight years. So I'm going to be <laughs> real rusty. Ah, rusty. Um, and I've not used Java since I was in uni, which was quite a while ago. But if you know about good like dependency analyzers and static analysis tools for either of those languages, preferably open source ones um, so that anyone can use it, um, I'd love to hear about it please pop an issue on uh, Kiln's GitHub repo. Yeah? So did you point the tool of its own code base? Did you learn any shocking things from it? Um, I've not yet because there's not any Rust tooling that I've added support for just yet, but that I should probably do. <laughs> um, but there is like the Cargo Audit projects, um, does something similar to bundler audit. So it's auditing your dependencies, looking for vulnerabilities. I have run cargo audit over it and we aren't using any vulnerable dependencies. Um, but I'm not aware of any rust like static analysis tools. Um, but that's definitely something I want to dig into a bit more um, and hopefully find something. Yep. That's okay. Yeah, so for the recording, the um, gentleman was asking if we could use Kiln to find vulnerabilities in um, a number of projects, uh, particularly for supporting things like bug bounties. Um, so absolutely. So if you deployed a Kiln stack and um, was running Kiln over commits to each project, so you could um, set up something that was watching their GitHub repo and uh, was cloning that repo and... Um, running the tools over it, then you could absolutely do that and look at stuff that's still open in their master branch. You could look at um, the Docker containers they're producing and look at possible vulnerabilities in those and analyze the data to look for stuff that hasn't been patched yet and we're still seeing in master. Uh, likewise, if you were using uh, things like Scout Suite when we had support for that, um, if you were running a pen testing job and you wanted to audit the uh, client's cloud environment and look for potential privest routes, this would help orchestrate those tools and give you findings to say, hey, you've got an IAM role that's overly permissive and could allow you to do, um, if you've got SSRF in this component and talk to the cloud metadata service, then you could go and talk to um, S3 buckets, even though you shouldn't have permission to do that. Uh huh. Um, you said documentation is coming, but can you just like in 
explain it like in five terms. Yeah, so most of the moving parts are Docker containers. So if you've got something that you can throw Docker containers at, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, the one caveat is there's a Kafka cluster somewhere in the middle of this. Now, for the demo stack, I've got a Dockerized version of Kafka, and that depends on something called Zookeeper for doing leadership elections inside a cluster. Um, for the love of God, do not run your own Kafka cluster. It's really painful and it takes a lot of setup and it's very fiddly. So unless you've got a Kafka sysadmin full time, just use a managed offering like Amazon MSK or Confluence platform. They're fairly cheap and it saves you a lot of headaches. So multiple small containers. So you only have to deploy the bits you're using. So, for example, if you're using Trello and not Jira, you shouldn't need to be running both of those components. You just deploy the bits you need and pay for what you're using. Um, the only bit that's not a Docker container is the command line tool itself. Um, and we're about to be releasing a Homebrew tab so you can install it on Macs, a Deb repo, an RPM repo, and we will be bundling up the source code as part of our release process. Already, I've just got... Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's coming on bro. Yeah, running this from a MacBook, I don't want people to have to install the Rust compiler and compile things from source. Because like I said, you shouldn't need to worry about Rust. You should just get a container or get a binary and carry on with your day. Right, cool. Um, if you do think of any questions later, I'm around all day. I'll be at the bar later if you want to chat over a beer. Um, I guess you got 20 minutes before the next talk if you want to grab a coffee. <laughs> Sorry for running a bit quick.